and uh, this morning I'd like to be able to share a little bit about worship. So let's get started. I entitled my message, A Worshipper is a Lover. Okay. A Worshipper is a Lover. I'll just turn to the Lord quickly for a word of prayer. Okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask for your help in uh, preaching this word about a worshiper and what a true worshiper is. Help me, Lord, because uh, this is the kind of person that your eyes search to and fro, seeking for those who worship you in spirit and in truth. And so help me, Lord, to really bring out what a worshiper is, the heart of a worshiper, the, the mindset, the attitude of a worshiper, that we might all be worshipers, we might be the kind of people that you seek, O oh Lord. So we thank you for that. Thank you for your help. In advance, Lord, I know that this is going to be a good word. This is going to be a wonderful message, and we are going to be blessed by this. So we receive your anointing, every one of us, not just me, but an anointing to understand and an anointing to be able to carry out the things that we learn today. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Bible tells us in John chapter 4 that Jesus said that the Lord seeks those who worship him in spirit and in truth. The word seek means to search out, you know. And it's interesting because uh, although he spoke this to a Samaritan woman who was by the well, uh, he used the word seek, which means he's searching. God is searching for the true worshipers. And it may be, you know, that uh, a Jewish man like Jesus would use the word seek even among Israel, the Israelites because there were many people that would go to the temple, that would go to the synagogue, and many times to offer sacrifices of praise, sacrifices of worship. But just like Isaiah said, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Those are not the, these are not the ones who worship him in spirit and in truth. God wants to seek a true worshiper. And so today, I want to I find out, I want to be able to share with every one of us here, what is a worshiper? What is a true worshiper? A lot of people think that uh, worship is that part of the service where people sing. Okay? And um, to some degree, that's correct. If you look at the liturgy or the program of a service, then we call it praise and worship, right? And so that would be the, pl the part where we sing songs. Okay? The thing is, not everyone worships. Not everyone worships. I, I, would, I would even venture to say that even here in this church, I would surmise that there are some who don't worship. There are some who just simply sing songs. They come here, they look at the board, look at the lyrics, and they sing the songs, but their heart's not in it. They're preoccupied by other things. A worshiper focuses on God. He, doesn't, he or she doesn't focus on God and what's for lunch, or on God and the fight that, or argument you had earlier this morning, or uh, focusing on God and something else. Worship is focused on God alone. He is the heart of worship, but He's the head and the foot of worship. He's the alpha and the omega of worship. He's the all in all of worship. And unless we are worshiping Him in spirit and in truth, meaning we are so focused on Him, that perhaps we're just singing. And I want to challenge you, first of all, to honor God. We honor, you know, you honor someone by being punctual. That's one of the ways that you honor someone, by being punctual. When you have an appointment with someone that is very important, like if our president said, I want to meet with you, come to my office at, let's say, 3 o'clock on this particular day, then by 2.30, you're already there. Why? You don't make him wait. See, you wait for him. He's the important person. So we go early. And it's the same thing. If God is God, you don't come for a 9.30 service. You don't come at 9.31. You don't come at 9.35. You don't come at 9.45. 
You know, the service ends at 11. You don't come at 10.55. It's dishonoring. If I will be really honest, it is dishonoring to the Lord. You come, if it's 9.30, you come at 9.20. You come at 9.25. You come at 9.15. Okay? You don't come past 9.30. So one way that you prepare your heart to worship is by being punctual because what that means is I'm meeting someone important. I have to be on time. You honor him. And that's where worship starts. It starts with honor. Worship comes from the old word worth-ship. It is ascribing worth to someone that is worthy, to someone that you deem important. And that's, what, that's where worship begins. It begins with honor. My mom would always tell me that punctuality is the hallmark of a mature person because the immature does not know how to be punctual. The immature just says, I'll go when I feel like going. See? Whether you call it pa importante, you call it grand entrance or whatever, it is the immature that comes late. The mature comes early because we respect time. Time is something once lost can never be regained. It can never be uh, taken back. See, you cannot go back in time. Only God can. We cannot. So once time is lost, it's gone forever. And so we respect other people's time by showing up on time. Now, if we think that worship is that part of the service where we sing, Although that is also correct, it is a very limited perspective and definition of worship. Worship has a private and a public component. In other words, there is private worship where it's just you and God, nobody else. And then there's public worship when the believers gather together like this and we worship together. Yeah, you might be worshiping uh, just two or three of you. That's still public because you're not by yourself. Or it might be two or three hundred of you. Or two or three thousand of you. Okay? That would be public. Private worship is just you and God and no other human being. Now, I want to submit to you today that worship goes beyond singing. Because first of all, what happens if a person can't sing? They just can't carry a tune. I mean, it's just permanent second voice, you know? They can't just seem to hit the notes that they're supposed to hit. I, they hit every other note except the right note, you know? And if worship is about singing, then that person will never be able to worship. You know, I mean, not all of us uh, will have a voice like Pastor Arnold. You know, I mean, praise God if you have a beautiful voice. And I know some of you do. Okay? And some of us, we've got average voices. And some of us, we've got permanent second voices. Okay? And that's perfectly fine. Here's the thing. See, God doesn't listen to the tune. He listens to the heart. Even if your mouth is singing, but if your heart is not, you're not worshiping. God would rather listen to someone that is so out of tune, but whose heart is singing, than someone who hits every note perfectly, but that's all he does, hit the note perfectly. Remember, God always looks at the heart. But today, I want to share with you that worship goes beyond singing. I want to I wanna show you that worship is really a lifestyle. Worship is a way of living. And I don't mean that in any kind of cliche form. I actually mean that it is a lifestyle. It's a way of living. Let's start with Romans chapter 12. Okay? In verse 1, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. Listen, this is truly the way to worship Him. Let's break this down a little bit. Paul now, after his 
11 chapters. This is the start of chapter 12. Okay? After 11 chapters of theology, he starts out by saying, okay, here's where the rubber meets the road. I've given you 11 chapters. Well, of course, there were no chapter numbers then, but I've, I've just written a lot about theology from sin to salvation to sanctification to just, uh, well, justification, sanctification, and offering yourself. Now, here's how we're going to put it all together. He said, my brethren, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. In other words, I'm not just talking about lip service. I'm not just talking about a Christian or a believer that says, praise God, hallelujah, amen. Okay? That's not the kind of believer I'm trying to raise up here with all the theology I just spoke about in 11 chapters, Paul is saying. What I'm saying is, I want you to give your bodies. In other words, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. That means with my mouth, with my heart, with my body, with my facial expression, with my words. Everything in me. With our bodies to God because of all He has done for you. So He spoke about the goodness of God for 11 chapters. He said, look, you were hopeless. You were hopeless. You were sinners. You were without hope. You were not even able to seek God, Romans chapter 3. But God called you, Romans chapter 5. And He justified you. And then He set you apart, chapter 6. And even though you struggled, chapter 7, with the, the things that you want to do, but end up not doing the things that you hate, that you do. And so now you're struggling and you cry out to God, who can help me? And God says in chapter 8, or Paul says in chapter 8, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In fact, let me tell you this, you cannot be separated from the love of God. Now in light of all that God has done for you, give yourselves, body and soul, everything, not just your lips, everything to God. Be a living and holy sacrifice. Now, a sacrifice, to be a sacrifice, must be dead. You have to kill an animal for it to be a sacrifice. But see, anyone can die for God because you, can, you just have to do it once. But to live for God, you have to do it every day. Every day. You got to live for God every day. There are no days off when you live for God. There's no, there's no vacation leave from being a believer. believer. You live for Him every single day. A living sacrifice. But not just a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice. And we're going to understand what that sacrifice means. And he says, the kind he will find acceptable. Which means there are kinds that he does not find acceptable. And then he ends it by saying, this is truly the way to worship him. So notice he didn't talk anything about singing. He didn't say anything about singing here. Okay, maybe it's time to sing again. <laughs> He did not talk about singing and he said, this is the way to worship him. It's a lifestyle. It's how you live from the time you wake up to the time you close your eyes at the end of the day. It's how you live. That is your worship. In fact, another version says, this is your reasonable act of worship. It is what is reasonable. The true worship, therefore, is the kind the Lord seeks. Or the, the true worship, which is the kind that the Lord seeks, is one whose life reflects the holiness and sacrificial attitude of Jesus Christ. This is the kind He finds acceptable. Does this include singing? Of course it does. Of course it includes singing. It includes clapping. It includes dancing. It includes standing right where you are without moving. All of that, as long as it's from the heart. 
but it is not limited to singing. It is glorifying God through your body. Or put another way, it is glorifying God through your acts of service. Now let's be clear about something. You can't serve God in order to be saved. Okay? We serve God because we are saved. Remember this. Salvation is not a reward to the good. It is a gift to the sinner. You don't earn salvation. But when you know you're, ser you're saved, you will serve. In other words, you are saved to serve. If you are not serving, either you don't understand what your salvation is all about, or you're not saved. There's one of the two. Either you are saved, but you don't understand why you were saved, or you're not saved at all. But we are called to serve. We are called to serve God. And in this message, I want to share with you what does it mean to serve God? What does it mean to worship God? And it means to serve God. But what does it mean to serve God in a way that is worship, in a way that is pleasing, a, 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 a living and holy sacrifice to Him? How do we live our lives so it becomes a reasonable act of worship? For this, I want to turn to John chapter 15, okay? And in John chapter 15, I want to give a little introduction. Well, actually, Jesus, in his, in his uh, teaching, John 15 uh, happened in the upper room, okay? During their, what we call the Last Supper, the Passover meal, okay? And he starts out with a little introduction, and this is what it says. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. God is calling us to fruitfulness. That means a life of worship is a life of fruitfulness. And we're going to connect that in a while. You may not see the connection yet now, but we'll get there. But since we're talking about fruitfulness, let me just make the connection right here and now. A life that is a life of worship will also be a life of fruitfulness. A life that does not worship I'm not talking about the worship service, okay, the singing part in a service, but a life that does not worship will also not be fruitful or not very fruitful, the kind of fruitfulness that God promised. I want to introduce to you three characters. The first one is the vine. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine. That's Jesus. My father is the gardener. So the father is the one that prunes, that does the pruning. Okay. And then he said, and you are the branches. So these are the three characters here. We've got Jesus, that is the vine. We have the father who's the gardener. And then connected to the vine are the branches, and that would be you and me. And the Bible says, he, the gardener, cuts off. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit. He cuts off the ones that do not bear fruit. And we will see what he will do with it later. But to the ones that bear fruit, he prunes. And in both the cutting off of the fruitless branches and the pruning of the fruitful branches, both entail cutting. Pruning is cutting, and cutting off is, well, cutting. And both are painful. It's just that when you're pruned, you are not detached. You are not severed from the vine. You're still attached to the vine when you're pruned. But when you're cut off, you're no longer connected to the vine. And make no mistake, Jesus is teaching something here. Anyone that is not fruitful will be cut off. They will be cut off. That is serious. 
Okay? It's serious. It's something that we seriously need to consider. Now, the pruning and the purifying is done by the message I've given you. Verse 3. By the message I've given you. So, every Sunday, as you hear the word, every Wednesday, for those of you that attend the Wednesday service, the midweek service, and every time you listen to God's word being preached, whether it's through YouTube or whatever Christian channel and stuff like that, and assuming that it is godly, you are being pruned. And that's why sometimes the word hurts. See, I cannot simply talk about things that you will enjoy. Because you're not going to be fruitful that way. There's a time to talk about blessing. There's a time to talk about disciplining. There's a time to talk about holiness. There's a time to talk about joy. And there's a time to talk about sorrow and, and well, the full counsel of God. There's a time to talk about the mercy of God. But there's a time to talk about the wrath of God. Otherwise, you're not receiving the full counsel of God. And in preaching God's word that is undiluted, you get pruned. And then he says something in verse 4. He says, remain in me. Now this is a command. He says, remain in me. And I will remain in you. It starts out with us. Remain in me and I will remain in you. In other words, you can even put an if there without changing the meaning of the sentence. If you remain in me, then I will remain in you. And so it begins with us. But pastor, isn't it also that Jesus said no one can snatch us from his hand? Yes, no one can snatch you from the hand of... You find that in John 17. No one can snatch you out of the hand of God. In other words, if you want to stay in Christ and someone else wants to snatch you out, they can't. But you can walk out. That's why he says, if you remain in me. It's your choice. It's your choice. When it's somebody else's choice to try and persuade you to turn away from Christ, they cannot snatch you. If you don't want to leave, no one can snatch you. And God's grace will be on you, so even you will not walk out. But walking out is still a choice. So he says, if you remain in me, I have friends who have turned away from Christ. I have friends who've been in the church for so long, and then they follow a different gospel a different set of teachings that, that's no longer scriptural. I have a pastor that I'm trying to reach out to even now because he has turned away from the true path. He has turned away and it breaks my heart because this pastor is a friend of mine. He's been my friend now for like, I don't know, 14 years. And now he's embracing a different doctrine. And it breaks my heart. But it's his choice. I'll, I, I'm trying to reach out to him. I still have to meet with him. And he keeps on changing, you know. He says, fine, I'll show up. And then on the day, he doesn't show up. But I cannot force him. Even if he meets with me, I cannot force him. I can only talk about the truth. And hopefully expose the error of his ways. But it will still be his choice. Because even if I force him, his heart would not be in it. That's why you cannot force anyone to get saved. They have to surrender their hearts willingly. They have to do it. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Because a branch cannot bear fruit. Now here's the thing. And this is what is implied. You don't see it here, but it's implied. If you remain in him, you will bear fruit. In other words, you cannot be attached to him and then continue staying fruitless. It doesn't work that way. You cannot be fruitless while you're attached to Christ. Because he can only produce after his own kind. And he is fruitful. So every branch in him will bear fruit. Every branch in him will bear fruit. But every branch 
separated from Him, even if they wanted to, cannot bear fruit. They cannot. They have been detached from the source of fruitfulness. Let's move on to verse 5. This is what it says. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them. Remember, in Scripture, even the order is important. Those who remain in me, it's talking about us. If we remain in him and he in us, will produce much fruit. It doesn't say might produce, may produce. No, will produce. And not just fruit. He said much fruit. And that's why he prunes us so that the branches that are bearing fruit will produce even more fruit. That's the purpose of the pruning. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me, these are the branches that are cut off, is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. In other words, spiritually, you will dry up. You will dry up. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Now, burning fire always speaks of judgment, always. It speaks of judgment unless it's the fire of the Holy Spirit. And even then, many times, it speaks of judgment when the fire of God comes down or acceptance of sacrifice. Okay? It speaks of judgment. Now, this one here, to be burned, does it mean that a person will go to hell? Perhaps that's what it seems like. Okay? Uh, or it could mean that this person may still be saved but might be walking in uh, a very difficult time. Let's just put it that way. Okay? Why? Because there's no fruitfulness. Yeah, there's no fruitfulness. But to be severed, you know, sounds pretty serious. Okay? It sounds pretty serious. So I hope you're not even considering uh, how far can I be detached from the vine and still be fruitful. I mean, don't flirt with sin. Okay? If you have any plans over the next week to flirt with sin, let me tell you now, change your plans. Okay? Be a living and holy sacrifice, pleasing to God. But if, and here's the if, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Now here he ch kind of changes it a bit. First he says, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. Now he changes it to words. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Now, what does it mean for Jesus to remain in us? It means you have his word. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly, the Bible says, I think in Ephesians. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. So for Christ to dwell in you means that the word must be rich in you. And that's why it is my conviction and and urgently strong recommendation that you practice memorizing scripture. It's something a lot of people don't do anymore today. When I was much younger in the Lord, memorizing scripture was part of my discipline. My mentor, one of my mentors, Brother Joe Laville, who has gone home to be with the Lord, um, told me, he would always say, Brother Joey, he was British, you know, make sure you memorize scripture. I said, what? <laughs> and so he told me, make sure you memorize scripture because one day you will need it. I said, where do I start? He said, start with John 3.16. I said, I already know John 3.16. Okay, then read the Bible, and if you find something you like, memorize it. And when you memorize it, let it be word for word. Choose any version you like, and at that time, it was, I think, New King James. And he said, memorize it word for word. Do not skip, do not interchange the words exactly the way it's written. That's how you memorize it. Do not add, do not subtract, do not change because you may not realize by changing some words, you can change the meaning completely. Do not do that. And so it became a practice of mine to memorize scripture at least one a week. And I did that for years. I still do it. Not anymore one a week. 
but I've got, I've got a bank in my heart filled with scriptures. And when I need it, the Holy Spirit just pulls out scriptures, brings it to my head and says, remember this? Oh yeah, that's right. You go through a test and then pulls out, remember this? Remember, I'm faithful. Remember, I change not. Remember, I am merciful. Oh yeah, that's right. Your word says, your word. that's why God says, bring my word to my remembrance. It's not because he's forgetful. He wants to know if you're forgetful. Are his words important to you? Are these words of life or are they just words? So he says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, listen, you may ask for anything you want. Here's the problem now. We ask for anything we want, but do we remain in him and do his words remain in us? Then we wonder why when we ask, we don't receive. Hmm. Just uh, put your elbow out a bit and the guy beside you. Just, just do that. Alam okay? na Just do that. And then do your elbows. Look at, look at him or her and just do like that. He said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, and there's an if, because we might, we might not do it. There's an if. If you remain in me and, I, and my words remain in you, you will ask for anything you want and it will, not it might, it will be granted you. When you produce much fruit, what does he say? You are what? Aha. So every disciple of Jesus is fruitful. Every single one, no exception. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciple. Which means there are fake disciples. Look at your neighbor, just go like that. Wag mo na si Corey, just, just look lang. Alam na yon. See, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciple. This brings great, great glory to my Father. Now what's interesting is this. Jesus kept on repeating himself from verse 4 all the way up to 7. Remain in me, I remain in you. Remain in me, I remain in you. Remain in me, my words remain in you. He kept on repeating it. It's almost like a broken record. And he uses four verses, four, five, six, and seven. He kept on repeating. I guess it must be important to remain in him. For him to do it again and again in four verses all connected to each other. Four, five, six, and seven. Let's move on. Verse 9. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. This is Jesus speaking. Remain in my love. Now, we come to another command. Remain in my love. Which means we can walk out. So he commands us, remain in my love. How do we do that? How do we remain in his love? Look at verse 10. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Anyone can say, I love God. The question is, are you obedient? Are you obedient? That's the proof that you are remaining in his love. Are you obedient to his commands? Is your life a living and holy sacrifice? Just I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. I want you to understand something here. Okay, this is the reason why we need pruning. See, the parts of us that get pruned out are the parts of the flesh. The, the part of us that does not want and cannot submit to God. The Bible says that the flesh and the Spirit of God are always at enmity. Okay, Romans chapter 8, I believe. The flesh and the Spirit are always at enmity. And the Spirit 
cannot, the Bible says, cannot submit to God. It cannot. So that's the part of us, the part of us, well, the flesh will always be with you until you die, okay? But the part of us that desires sin more than God, the part of us that desires to live independently of God, maybe not choosing sin, you know, like cheating, lying, idolatry, adultery, and all that stuff like that, okay? Um, having an unbelieving boyfriend or girlfriend for you singles, okay? It may not be something like that, but you just want to live your life independently of God. I'll just do my thing. I'll be nice. I'll be good. But, you know, God wants me to be a missionary. I don't like that. I just want to work here in Manila. I don't want to go up to the mountains. I don't want to go work in some tribal place. I don't want to be a missionary somewhere. I like it here. And I'll serve God here. And you might be doing good things, but not the right things. And so you're still living independently of God. That's the flesh. The flesh wants to be religious and cannot be spiritual. Our spirit hates religiosity but loves spirituality. See? And so it's that part of us that gets pruned. Little by little, getting pruned. And as these parts are getting pruned, we become more fruitful. And that's why we need pruning. So that it will be easier for us, to some degree, to remain in the love of God. And how do we do it? By obeying His commands. Remember, the flesh is that part of us that does not want to submit to God. The flesh doesn't mind doing good things. It just doesn't want to do the God thing. And here's the thing. The world thinks that if I am so submitted to God's will, God will make me do things that I don't like. He will make me marry someone that's not my type. And he will make me live in a place that I hate. Because we think that when we ask for bread, he'll give us stone. We have a wrong perception of who God is. Because God is not good. At least that's what we think. Because if he is, you would be a fool not to surrender yourself completely and totally to his will. The world thinks that if you submit to God's will, He will rob you of joy. Because you cannot do what you want to do. I have to do what He wants me to do. And what He wants and what I want are not the same. So He robs me of joy. That's why, you know, it's like, let me enjoy life first and then I'll serve God. But He says, no. See, you have to understand something. We were created by God to serve Him. We were created by God to obey Him. Therefore, if that is true, nothing will give us greater joy than to submit to Him so completely and to follow Him. Nothing will give us greater joy. But when we think otherwise, you have fallen into the lie of the enemy. When God said, Thou shalt not eat from the fruit of that tree, and Satan comes, the serpent comes and says, that's not true. That's not true. You're not going to die. God just doesn't want you to have fun. Do you know how wonderful the fruit of that tree is? It's so wonderful that when you eat it, you will be like him. God doesn't want you, to be, want you to be like him. He wants you to be something else. He's depriving you of real joy. Go ahead and eat it. No, but God doesn't want. Yes, because he doesn't want you to have fun. He's a killjoy. And you know what? The lies of the enemy haven't changed. It's still the same today and people still fall for it. People still think that submitting to God's will is boring or at best it's boring. And at worst, it'll kill you. That's what we think. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. No, we were designed to obey God. And that's why nothing can give us greater joy. And you will never experience that overflowing joy until you are so surrendered to His will. I remember when the Lord told me to be a missionary. 
the idea of being a missionary was so horrifying to me that I really didn't want to be a missionary. And, and my mentor, Brother Joe, and my pastor at that time said, why don't you just go for the training? Just go for the training. You don't have to go, you know, just, just go for the training. I said, fine, I can do the training. You know, it was a seven-month training, so I said, fine, I'll do it. I went through the training, and then two months into the training, our pastor said, oh, by the way, guys, I want you to know that when we send you out for two years, that's part of your training. I said, what the heck? So I went out into the mission field. I tell you, I was whining, I was complaining for two weeks. And then after that, I loved it. And now you can't take missions out of me. See, I, I, I thought I wouldn't like it. But I was designed to be a missionary. I was designed to go out and travel. And that's why if I stay in one place too long, I got to go out. I have to go out. It's, it's my DNA. Do you know what DNA is? Divine nature in action. That's your DNA. See, every one of you has a DNA. Not this scientific, diribonucleic thing of a jig acid thing, okay? But divine nature in action. So now Jesus tells us to remain in his love by obeying his commands. What commands? The Ten Commandments? Is that what he's talking about? Well, perhaps, because the Ten Commandments can be summarized like this. Love God and love your neighbor. That's the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments all point to God. Okay? Love the Lord your God. There is no other, uh, make no idols. Um, don't take his name in vain. And remember the Sabbath. They all point to God. And from the time it says, honor your father and mother, all the way until the 10th, okay, which is, uh, do not covet thy neighbor's wife and thy neighbor's goods, and everything in between, that's all towards man. You love God, love your neighbor. All the commands can be summarized in this. You shall love, hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is like unto the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That means loving your neighbor is as important as loving God. If you love God, you will love your neighbor. So how do we show this love to God? Well, John 15, let's continue, verse 12. And let's do this a little bit faster. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Love each other. That means love your neighbor. Okay? He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the believers. Love each other in the same way I've loved you. Think about how God loves you. Does his love show patience? Well, if you think yes, was he patient with you? Then be patient with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because some of them are less mature than you. Some of them are annoying. Some of them are nakakainis. But they are believers. Love them. And some of them are wonderful. Actually, all of them are wonderful. You're just having a hard time to see the wonder in them. And so you wonder if they're saved. <laughs> love each other in the same way. Everyone say, same way. That means no difference. In the same way, I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. I want you to see something. How do we show our love for one another? There's no greater love or expression of love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now, it might seem like this means I have to die for my friends, okay? 
it may include that. But like I said, dying is something you do only once. But God calls us to be a living sacrifice. So what does it mean to give your life, to lay down one's life for one's friends? It talks about serving them. Being there for them. Being inconvenienced for them. See, one of the things we don't like is to be inconvenienced. We don't like that. Nobody likes to be disturbed. You know, just when you're all nice and comfortable, you're already at home, and then your friend, disciple, brother, sister in Christ calls and says, Kuya, I have a problem. Can we talk? Can we meet? Can we, you know? It's like, what? Pwede bukas na lang? I just got home. I'm tired. I took off my shoes already. You know, it's so hassle to put it back on. It means to put another person's life before yours. That's what it means. It means allowing yourself to be inconvenienced for the sake of others. It means encouraging others even when you yourself need encouragement. It means rejoicing with others even if you are, be, are depressed. It means weeping with others even if you are beside yourself with joy. It means being sensitive to them. If they're down, you come down beside them. No matter how excited and how wonderful a test, you just wanted to share your testimony with your friend and then you find that your friend is down in the rut, you don't share your testimony. You go down there with them and you cry with them. You be sensitive to their needs. You don't come insensitive and say, what, you feel that way? Guess what happened to me? You'll just make them more depressed. See? No, we're not like that. It means being strong for them even when you yourself feel so weak and so tired and so dry, but you're there for them. That's what it means to lay down one's life. Listen, what the, listen to what he said in verse 16. You didn't choose me. I chose you, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. What's he talking about? He's talking about disciples. That's what he's talking about. See, if a worshiper is a lover, what do you love? Well, love God, love your neighbor. Therefore, in this context, I submit to you, a worshiper is someone who puts his life on the line for other people. A worshiper is someone who will spend, who will pour out his life into someone else. There's a word for that. It's called discipleship. That's what it is. Discipleship. You cannot be a worshiper and then not disciple because it's in discipling that you bear fruit. Your disciples are your fruit and fruit that will last. These are, these are people that you will not allow to stray. You will be there for them. And when they start to stray, you will be there and try and bring them back into the center of God's will. He said, this is what is pleasing to me. Our reasonable act of worship. Let me close with this. 1 John 4, 20. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. The word hate here does not necessarily mean you feel like shooting them. No, 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 no. The word hate here even can also mean you're just not going to go out of your way for them. It's like, bahala ka sa buhay mo. I'm already comfortable here. Don't disturb me. Kind of thing. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot, 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 cannot love God, whom they have not seen. Strong words. You see your brother and sister in need, and you don't help, don't tell me you love God. They need encouragement, you don't encourage, don't tell me you love God. You see your brother and sis or sister in need, 
and you don't help. It might be a word of encouragement. It might be just an arm around their shoulder or a shoulder that they can lean on and cry on. An ear that they can just pour out their hurts and you be there for them and you listen. If we cannot do that for our brothers and sisters, how can we say we love God? See, anyone can say they love God. Show me. How much do you love your brother or sister? How much are you willing to lay? See, we're not even talking about laying down your life for them. We're just talking about laying down a few minutes of your time. Not life, just your time. Maybe they have nothing to eat and you say, you know what, come. Let me buy you lunch. Or come to my house. Let's just fellowship. I have food, come over. And you feed them. Maybe when they can't. When they can't pay their rent. Or they can't buy their groceries. Because they have nothing left. And you're down to a few bucks. And you say, let me share this with you. Let me buy you something. I can just afford to buy one meal for you because I only have this much. I can only buy one meal for myself. Let's share it together. And it's in this that God said, and then, and then you will ask my father whatever and he will give it. Because you see, when you start to put other people and see them before you, you know what's going to happen? When you have disciples that you learn to truly love and put down your life for them, you will pray for them before you even pray for yourself. And when you do that, God will always hear. And He will move in response to your prayer for someone else. Most people just pray for themselves. And then we wonder why God doesn't, God doesn't answer. Now you know why. Love one another. And let me close with this. Jesus said in John 17, when he was praying, first thing he did after opening his prayer, saying, Father, glorify me now again, even as I have glorified you. And glorify me with the glory that I had before. And then he says this, Father, I pray for my disciples. See, he doesn't pray for himself. He's about to go to the cross. He didn't say, Father, save me. Father, please somehow give me divine anesthesia so I don't feel all the pain. No. He said, Father, I'm about to go. I'm about to glorify yourself again. For the last time here on earth. Now, before I do that, I bring my disciples to you. I've given them your name, he said. I've protected them with your name. Now watch over them. I do not pray that you take them out. I pray that you protect them while they're here because I'm going home to you. Now watch over them. But Father, he said, I pray not only for them, but I pray for all the others who will still believe in me. That means right now they're still unbelievers. But I pray for them. Not for everyone. Only those who will, pray for, uh, who will believe in me. I pray for them who will become my sheep one day. I pray for them. You know what that tells me? That tells me, you and I, we need to pray for the lost. We don't know how many of them will become sheep. How many of them will get saved. We don't know. And so we just reach out. Remember this. When the Bible says to love your brothers and sisters, it also speaks outside of time. That means it speaks about all future brothers and sisters who may not be saved right now, but will one day be saved. And what that means is we need to start making efforts to win the lost. Those empty seats that you have next to you should not be empty. 
It's not just about filling up the seats. It's about people who need the Lord. How can we say we love God and then we know we've got friends and relatives who are not saved and we're not doing anything to share the gospel with them? Or at least pray for them. Invite them to service. If you don't know how to share the gospel yet, at least invite them to service. How can we say we love God and we don't care about where our friends and loved ones will spend eternity? No. That must change. If we love God, show it by loving your brothers and sisters. Even those who are not yet our brothers and sisters, but one day may may become our brothers and sisters. It's time that we win the lost and make disciples. Only worshipers can do that. If you look at Matthew 19, 28, 19, and 20, and it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, just back up one verse. Back up one verse, verse 18. And it says, And when the disciples, and Jesus met with his disciples, and they worshiped. It starts with worship. Before he said, go and make disciples, he said, it says, and they worshipped. It starts with worship. It always produces disciples. A true worshiper is a lover. A lover of God and a lover of people. That's a true worshiper. It's not just about singing, but it does include singing. My prayer is that you might catch this. Because not all those who cry, Lord, Lord, will make it to heaven except those who obey the will of my Father, Jesus said. Please do not take evangelism, soul winning, and discipling lightly. Do not for one moment think it is optional. It isn't. It isn't. It's a command. It is called the Great Commission. It is not optional. Every true child of God will be discipled and will disciple that you might bear fruit. Having said that, some of you here perhaps may not have surrendered your life to Jesus yet. Maybe you came here and you've been coming here, but you've never done that. You've never surrendered your life. You've never done it consciously. You've never articulated that. Lord, I surrender my life to you. If you've never done that, I encourage you, do it today. Surrender your life today and enter into that joy that Jesus was talking about, overflowing joy. And learn what it's like to walk with Jesus. My friend, if you're here right now and you've never done that, join me in this prayer. Pray with me, a prayer of repentance and total surrender. I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes right now, bow their heads as we pray in this room. Join me. Let the words come out of your mouth. Pray it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, today I choose to reject the way of sin. I choose you. Be my Lord, my God, my Savior, and my best friend. Thank you for loving me. Teach me how to love you, to worship you, and to serve you all the days of my life. Cause me to be fruitful. And I give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.